Spencer Roberts is a writer, ecologist, musician, and solar engineer from Colorado who tweets under the moniker Unpop Science. And the other day, a really interesting thread caught my eye where he made the case that the recent disappearance of huge numbers of crabs from Alaska, which was pinned to climate change, might have actually had a much more prosaic and predictable story behind it, which is the fact that there are fishing industries that are extracting at levels that are unsustainable. And so we have with him a conversation about greenwashing. About the entire concept of sustainability and what that leads to. About buying indulgences, you know, about the corporate superstructure that we all depend upon and how we can actually introduce humanity back into that. It's a huge conversation. We talk for almost two hours and we cover everything from sea crabs to methane digesters to the revolution of the material basis of civilization. Crust slip. Crust slip theory gets a mention. <laughs> uh, Spencer Roberts is a fantastic conversationalist. He's a great writer. Check out his work in The Intercept and in Nautilus and Jacobin. I don't think I pronounced that wrong. Jacobin. I don't know how to pronounce that. I've never said that out loud. Folks, if you enjoy the podcast, please share it with somebody so that we can reach more minds and actually get these discussions to uh, facilitate change in the world because we need to change some things in our society if we want to see our civilization continue. If you really love what we're doing, we could really use your support at patreon.com uh, slash demystify sci. We're desperately trying to refurbish our studio we need a better computer and we have no money so please if you can just give a few dollars to make that happen we want to be able to actually do these podcasts live which requires some pretty serious uh computer infrastructure but we really want to be able to just have these happen so you guys can be talking to us while we're doing them and that's no small task so consider just throwing us a few dollars and i believe we can make it happen pretty soon and if you've already done that, tell a friend. And in the meantime, enjoy the conversation with Spencer Roberts. We'll see you next week. The scientific revolution starts now. To give listeners a sort of crash course, which they've probably heard something about the closure of the uh, crab fishing season in the Bering Sea, right? That's what put this in the news. And, uh, you know, the regulators and the scientists monitoring this population didn't really have a good explanation for why something like 10 billion crabs and their model have, quote unquote, disappeared. That's sort of the um, word that's been in the headlines, right? A billion crabs disappeared, something along the lines of that. And, you know, there have been there have been some theories offered and there are a lot of possible hypotheses. And I'm not pretending to know the answer here. And it's very likely that there are many factors interacting to cause this crash, which definitely seems to be real. Um, however, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll review some of the hypotheses really quickly. So the main uh, theory put forward by NOAA scientists, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, is that climate change has caused the collapse of the snow crabs nursery. There's this dense uh, cold layer of water called the cold pool that forms in the winter when sea ice forms in the Bering Sea. It's an important habitat for young snow crabs. Uh, predators can't get in there. Like cod and other predators that might eat them it's too cold for them so as this cold pool retracts one theory is that cod are getting in there and they're eating the crabs another theory is that uh a parasitic alga that uh, affects the crabs has you know increased and killed a bunch of crabs another theory is that maybe they crossed some metabolic threshold and they've had to they needed more food and there wasn't enough food so there was a mass die-off but one really important factor that NOAA doesn't talk about very much and that you didn't hear in many of the early headlines is fishing, right? There's a huge industrial operation to not only extract snow crabs and king crabs, by the way, who are also crashed, 
but also all sorts of other marine life in the Bering Sea. And they're using techniques like trawling, just like dragging huge nets across the seafloor, right? Catching t- literally tons of bycatch every day. And bycatch is when you catch uh, an animal that you're not targeting, right? And throw them back in the water. Usually they're dead by that time because they can't breathe in the air. Or if they do breathe air, they drown and they're, as they're being dragged through the water. Um, so there are uh, some really important indications that fishing pressure has increased as we can look at the uh, GPS movements of ships moving north as the sea ice has retracted into places they previously couldn't access in the winter. We can look at the at NOAA's own stock assessments, looking at the fishing mortality rates, the bycatch reporting from the observers on the ships. We see big spikes during these uh, low sea ice years. So, um, yeah, I just sort of pointed that out. And um, it it's, seemed it's to get really interesting how, it, how, how in that sense, the change of climate does affect the crabs ultimately, but there's yeah. this inserted step where the change of climate affects how the fishermen behave. And yes. that affects the crab population. Yeah, like we are pretty, uh, I think, savvy in general about how um, oil and shipping industries are trying to exploit the retracting sea ice, looking for new shipping lanes, new places to drill. Um, not paying as much attention to how that opens new winter fishing grounds. And that could be a really critical protection for species like crabs on the seafloor you know so um yeah i started looking into uh some some of that data and i stumbled across this whistleblower account from last year actually where a scientist named braxton do who worked for noaa back in the 80s well he had worked for them up until uh 2009 but uh, essentially, he was doing in situ or uh, observational dives. He was doing research like diving underwater, did like 943 dives with the king crabs in the Gulf of Alaska. And he came to really butt heads with his bosses because he was trying to explain why their trawl surveys uh, were inaccurate because of the behavior of the crabs. They formed these pods where they uh, come together in the daytime to rest. And these big domes or spheres, the juveniles form these little spheres, the adults form these domes. And well, they've known that they just pile up like in a big cuddle puddle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's not really well understood why, even from Du, who's, you know, like maybe the world expert in this, or he's probably watched crabs do this the most, king crabs at least. And um, they just do it during the day or, or it's yes, like at night they forage, right? So at night they spread out and they sort of like, yeah, they go across the sea for looking for food. And then the day they come together, maybe it helps them get protection from predators. Maybe it helps them conserve energy. It's not really totally understood. This is, uh, this is you, one of those cases where science, you really reach the limits of science when you start talking about wildlife and things that live in the environment. Because if you can do something in a laboratory, you might be able to get at why it is that they're doing it. was like one guy willing to make 900 dives <laughs> yeah, to the bottom of exactly. the Alaskan Gulf. Everybody else is like a pile of crabs. I don't, um, it's the stuff of nightmares, I'm all right. Well, that's the thing though, is I think there would be a lot more people who would be willing to do those dives. You know, you get a dry suit, it's not so bad. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, they, so he brought this evidence to Noah and he said, I think our trawl surveys are inaccurate because the crabs are not evenly distributed across the seafloor. So basically when we're doing a trawl, we're assuming and we're extrapolating that density of crabs that we get to the whole seafloor, but they're really unevenly distributed. So we should be using different survey methods. And it caused this turmoil in the agency that culminated in his transfer from Kodiak to Seattle. They dismantled the dive research program. And yeah, he spent the next 12 years in Seattle waiting for his former bosses to retire so that he could publish his final manuscripts on king crab ecology and behavior. Wow. Really, yeah, it turns our understanding of how these crabs behave kind of on its head. 
And but, it raises some really interesting questions about the modeling that Noah's using in terms of the crab can, populations. Can, can we talk about the like antagonistic motivational structures that he's up against in that community? Because yeah, yeah like you, I, I read in one of your articles that some enormous percentage of the population is involved in that industry. So hold on, before we get to the antagonistic things, as part of that, I want to ask why the changing of the survey techniques would have been so disastrous. Like, it, why are his superiors so upset about changing the survey Yeah, that's a good question. It could be, I mean, there's certainly a hubristic element of just challenging their authority, I think. But there's also a big, well, and this sort of ties into your question, that we have... The way that we regulate the fishing of these species is based on these surveys and these models of their population. And the there are these things uh, in NOAA. And the first thing I'll say is that NOAA is in the Department of Commerce, which mm. is also very interesting, right? All of our other wildlife agencies are in the Department of Interior. The and forestry NOAA, industry is part of the USDA. Say that? Uh, for, uh, forestry department is part of the right, uh, that's USDA. True. Yeah. Which I remember when I saw that the first time on one of the forestry trucks, I was like, wait a second, what? But it is. Yeah, it no, is. you're right. You're right. Forest services in the USDA, and there's also wildlife services in the USDA, which we could talk about later with the wolf thing. Um, but uh, NOAA being in the Department of Commerce is an interesting conflict of interest. And there are these, uh, the way that these fisheries are regulated is there are these uh, advisory panels and management councils that mandate a certain amount of their seats be filled by representatives of the fishing industry. So there's an institutionalized corruption problem and something like totally changing the survey techniques to potentially estimate uh, or model a smaller population of crabs means that they're going to have to reduce those catch limits, means that those representatives of the fishing industry on those management councils are going to be upset. So okay. I think it's something like that. But there's there's got to be some kind of difference in relationship between the people that are on the fishing council that have some kind of industrial mm -hmm. stake versus the people that are the actual fishermen that are, or fisherwomen or fisher people mm -hmm. that are going out and actually getting the crabs. And so while the person who's sitting on the committee might be interested in maintaining higher levels of catch, it seems hard to imagine that the people who are actually doing the catching are not well aware that they have to manage their their fishery yeah and it's true a lot of the fishermen or the fishers i guess i'll say are uh upset and really questioning noah's management and th there's uh, a lot of so for my article i've talked to uh several fishermen in this big community sort of organizing to stop alaskan trawler bycatch that's a huge point of contention among not just uh crabbers and um uh you know other sorts of uh, commercial fishing but also subsistence fishing communities uh which you know there are a lot of in alaska and i mean a huge thing for them is salmon right they've depended for millennia on the salmon runs up the rivers and you know factors from dams to uh, water withdrawals irrigation to uh trawling have all devastatingly impacted the salmon and the salmon runs are pretty much in a critical state. And um, yeah, so the fishing industry and the fishing regulation is related, but separate to the individual fishers. It's complicated. But, oh, go ahead. I just, I, I think it's really interesting how almost every government process has to, in some sense, tie back to uh, commerce, right? It, it's a bureaucracy that's organized around the interests of its stakeholders, essentially. I mean, the whole government, really. And if you think who has the biggest stakes, it's like kind of obvious. Like if you look at lobbying, the the commerce, uh, I think the Chamber of Commerce is at the top of, lo of, of lobbying. 
Um, it's, mm. If it's not the Chamber of Commerce, it's the real estate, followed by all of the medical industries. And uh, yeah, yeah I, and I, you I, see these uh, these yeah. NOAA regulators. Go, there's a you know very obvious revolving door where, for instance, the uh, chair of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, the one that regulates these uh, Bering Sea fishing industries. Uh, now works for one of the corporations operating trawlers in the Bering Sea, you know, and he was uh, the head of that council during the snow crab crash and then left to one of these trawling corporations. So, yeah, there's a, a, a ton of corruption. And no, I think even more so than uh, in the DOI, probably not the USDA, but um, it's, yeah, is, is there a huge... Like pervasive problem is there hope <laughs> is there hope like what could we like in a dream world what would our how what what are the fewest changes that we could make to our system of governance that would protect us from these kind of corruptions because it seems yeah. kind of baked into the corporate model of the republic right now because yeah, yeah, i definitely. think you're exactly right about that because there's there's a crazy tension where on some level you want to be able to have a government that's able to protect the interests of the people, but when you have a government that's funded largely, like you said, not just largely, but like, come on. Well, I mean, like, I'm looking. I, I actually pulled up. Like, the I'm not. Pa- I'm not paying for the U.S. military with like my tax dollars aren't doing a damn thing. Basically. Yeah, so I mean, like, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce spent sixty-six million dollars lobbying Congress last year. Association of Realtors forty-four, Pharma thirty. And then yeah. there's another business roundtable that spent another thirty. Like we're not we're not in charge of the ship. They're also paying all the taxes, basically. Too. I mean, not the, not the corporations themselves. They, but the you know the people who are shareholders of that and the the very top echelon of those people who are in charge. I mean, come on, wait, that's where the money comes from for the whole government. So it's how do you untangle that? I mean, yeah. I don't expect you to have the answer. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good question. And I would say, I mean, the first thing is that we have to tackle these institutionalized problems, like I was talking about, where the, the management councils are required to have people who represent the industry on the council. And like, we're looking at the same things with COP and stuff like that. In COP 27, we have all these. Um, and at the UN Food System Summit and things like that, like we have these huge lobbying groups, like, we just cannot have them at the table. Like you can't have industries regulate themselves. It just does not work. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the institutional process, but I also think that we have to, and this is kind of an unpopular thing. um, When you talk about like exchange of power, you have to clean house, you know, like there is a deep state of, and it's much more boring than people think, you know, like people know like, you can look at Michael Bolton or whatever serving uh, uh, in the defense department through several um, different administrations. But like, you know, how about Vilsack in the uh, in the uh, secretary of agriculture, right? In between his two terms, he was literally a milk lobbyist, right? So we have these guys and there, it goes all the way down, right? And so and there this are was, these this guys and the, it's I not think even Snowden's... just the... This was Snowden's definition of the deep state. He's like, it's not some mysterious, like creepy, spooky thing. It's yeah. just the it's it's the empty space of the unelected officials that persist from administration to administration. And are growing the growing <laughs> empty space, right? Like the bureaucracy of the government is just blowing up. Actually, all institutional bureaucracies are just going through the roof right now. Yes, it's really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the real reality of the deep state is very boring and bureaucratic. Like. And it goes all the way down and it's not just, it's not just direct financial relationships, but it's also a culture, right? Like if you are highly critical as a marine biologist of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, you're probably not going to get hired by them. And if you do, you're not going to climb your way up the ladder and, you know, get in a position where you're able to really affect important changes. So um, it's kind of unpopular when, uh, and it's an enormous, it's enormously resource intensive and time consuming when, um, you know, power changes hands. And I don't know if we've ever had a president that was really interested in totally reforming the system, but I do think you'd have to clean house and kind of fire a lot of these people who are 
all the way down the system. And there are good ones too. And so maybe, you know, you have a process where they reapply for their jobs, but you have to change the, not just the institutions, but the culture. And that's really difficult, I think. Like the culture of professional politician, even it's like, uh, Anastasia and I just started a little side project where we're analyzing the Constitution line by line and just trying to make sense of like what what's gone wrong here, really. You know, like are there any singular amendments that could fix this mess that we're in? And it's and and one of the first things that we realized is like, oh man, a lot of people are gonna have to lose their jobs, and that's not gonna make like that's gonna be a hard thing to ratify, right? It's like, you know, this is. Because if you look at, um, I think that it's uh, Switzerland, you know, it's quite interesting how the, their government's set up where the um, the government officials are normal people. They have jobs. They're not um, professionals, right? Mm-hmm. The president rides the train to work every morning, too. And so it's like, even if we could pull off something, that's obviously a much smaller scale. And, you'd, you know, you'd have to reimagine the entire network. But, wow, what an unpopular idea when a huge percentage of the population is tied up in that bureaucracy in terms of survival. Yeah. And not only that, but you you have people that have, the people who are holding the levers are people that have spent their entire lives being loyal to the institution. Mm -hmm. And you see this all over the place. Like the people that rise to the top of an institution are not the people who are then going to turn around and be like, let's burn it down. It, yeah. that it just they're completely incompatible goals because the people who get promoted, the people who get the opportunities, the people who get the jobs are always the ones who are willing to be like, well, I support the goals of the institution. No right. one in their right mind would hire you for a position if you're a if you're a revolutionary openly. And honestly, mm-hmm. if you're a revolutionary and you you spend 30 years climbing the corporate ladder, I have fires probably gone out by that point because you've had to give up so much to get to the top of that, that like no one can yeah. play that kind of a long game and not, and not be eaten by it. And so I just, for me, I, I cannot imagine somebody who gets elected to the highest office in the country and then turns around and is like, let's clean house because like we talked about at the very top, all of the platforms are, are captured. Like there was a, there was a, there was a weird thing that happened at the last election, and I understand it because we don't have third parties in this country, and any time that you have a third party candidate, it blows everything up. But um, I think that it was like, uh, I don't remember who organized this, but it was, it was called the, um, the Unity Party. And they were like, why don't we take a moderate Republican and a moderate Democrat and put them on a ticket together and have a centrist party? And they, they had like some general and Andrew Yang, I think. Oh, right, right. And honestly, I was like, it's a great idea. And, and they threw them off Twitter like they, the next day. They blocked every single way to access their social media. Yeah. They basically were just like, absolutely not. We're not having this. It just sounds like the Democratic Party to me. I, I felt like all their policy proposals were, were pretty much identical. But an, another interesting thing, like you were talking about um, – Cleaning house, I think one of the funniest examples that I just wanted to throw out there is uh, the postmaster, what's his name, DeJoy, mm. where he literally tried to sabotage the election and like close down the post offices and Biden didn't fire him. He did. I mean, it's not even like insulting to just, you know, all right, I'm going to hire my own postmaster, but like that's the culture. Like that would be uncivil to fire this man, even though he literally tried to tank the whole election. I don't know. It's just the, it's it's a toxic civility in politics. Which is why I think the answer is not a top-down thing. Like, I really think that hyper-localism and, like, it's weird because there's an alignment here on the right and the left. Because I think that they're, the same way that there's like a little bit of like, a, I, I really believe in the horseshoe theory of fascism where you get far enough to the left and you get far enough to the right and you have like deeply authoritarian people that are interested in, you know, camps and and destroying the people who disagree with them. And I'm fundamentally terrified of that. But I do think that there is a unity on the left and on the right where they're like, government is failing us. And one of the ways that it's failing is it is failing to protect our interests over corporate interests. But are we like playing into the myth that the monolithic superstructure is the god that decides everything? Is it possible? I so. Maybe. Well, I, maybe. I just wonder, like, okay. Um, 
weed, right? Federally illegal for since ever. Well, since I've been alive. But in California, people started to just be like, eh, go away, feds, right? And the feds persisted for a while, but it was very expensive and time consuming. And eventually they were just like, ah, screw it, right? And how many other issues could be dealt with on a local level like that where the feds would we, we would essentially be defanged by, you know, sheer neglect. I think that there's a difference here, which is that you're talking, I, I think you're totally right, where on an issue where it's government regulation that's stopping something, if everybody unilaterally agrees and is like, we're not, we're not going to listen to you anymore, that I think is effective. But if you're looking at something like fisheries, and it's the little farmer who's against a massive corporation that has money and time and power and the ear of the government, that's very different because you're not just throwing off the yoke of an oppressive government. You're fighting against somebody that has a huge amount of money. Like, I think back to the coal mining strikes. I think back to Ludlow, Colorado. I think back to Mother Jones where and the Pinkerton Detective Agency and the Bridgerton Detective Agency, which is that these corporations have tons and tons and tons of money to throw at destroying people who stand up to them. And so you're not fighting the government in the same way that you are when you're like, well, weed should be legal. Right, like the interests of the people are very much in line with the corporations. So I think that's what you mentioned. Right, and the thing too about weed, I would say, is that it wasn't the recreational use of the drug that, was the reason it was criminalized. It was the industrial use for paper building materials and things like that. And it was really those like timber and um, construction industries, as far as I understand, <clears throat> maybe there was some pharmaceutical involved, but timber was a huge reason that it was actually criminalized in the first place. Really? Yeah, a good yeah, dose of racism really too. That. Still that's, yeah, that's and still it's very hard to, uh, you know, industrially grow hemp. Very hard. So, yeah. It's much yeah. easier to just grow the psychoactive compounds. Yeah, exactly. Like, which is fascinating. And, it, and uh, yeah, I could go off on and, that. But I think that that's the core of it, which you should go off on, which is that <laughs> there is a deep-seated link between industry and regulation and the people are just kind of floating in the middle. And well, the humanity is not accounted for. That seems to me to be like the central crisis. It's that corporations, first of all, the government is essentially founded on the corporate model. Corporations are incentivized by growth exclusively. And yeah, there might be like some divestment on a human level, but it's, it's not enough. And Can you elaborate on your government as a corporate structure thing? Because I thought that was, you brought that up the other day and I thought it was really interesting. I mean, I don't know a ton about this, but from what I can tell, the idea of a president and a cabinet are essentially corporate ideas. And mm. a lot of the founding fathers came from corporate backgrounds. Uh, you know, the corporation was a pretty well-established model that was quite effective at organizing uh, resources that were larger than any particular company could muster. So, you know, if a couple of you know, different industries want to make an excursion to some far off land and extract different resources they could get together and, you know, raise the funds to do that. And ultimately, that's what we do in a modern republic as well. We organize, uh, you know, militaries or other uh, sh shared interests um, to protect, well, shared, what are these called? Shared infrastructure to protect our interests um, or their interests or whoever is paying the bills, essentially. And yeah, and I think we also have this huge um, conflation between, and it's part of the mythos of the whole country, between, well, about what democracy is, right? Like, we're, we're voting, right? Well, no, you're voting for someone that then votes on issues for you. We don't have direct representation. We can't vote on issues. Sometimes we can. We get a ballot referendum every once in a while. And it usually is something, you know, not extremely uh effectual although it can be but yeah it's something like legalizing weed or something like that but um yeah like voting for representatives a republic is not a democracy right and it's sad because the conversation is like well democracy doesn't work and it's like this is the worst imaginable version of of practicable democracy like we operate in our own house like just when we're picking out movies or something we can come up with a better version of democracy than this like ranked choice is fantastic there's right. all sorts of different democratic 
ideas that don't have to even be as extreme as a referendum for you know 300 million people like it could, we can literally just come up with like a few options and then at least people can end up with their second choice having some influence or something but this mm -hmm. you know the the version that we have is completely broken and I don't think that that impugns the whole concept of democracy at the same time, which is what people usually jump to. Mm. When you when we talk about Alaska's fishing industry and we talk about these big industrial catches versus the small scale f fishers, what is the what is the rate at which the people who live in Alaska are involved in really big operations versus smallholder operations? That's a great question. Um, I don't know the figures on that, but I can tell you that it's consolidated over time, right? So like a lot of things. Um, so whereas uh, at one point, maybe a hundred years ago, you could have a little, and the, you know, for, for mil or thousands of years, um, indigenous nations had, you know, went out in canoes and hauled up salmon like, more than they could possibly eat, you know, uh, just a canoe full, or they'd set a net in the river. But, you know, they had these important traditions like, uh, letting the first salmon keep, uh, letting them go upstream, you know, to find their tributaries. And, you know, maybe those strongest salmon would, uh, see the next generation, you know, like, concepts that are actually very scientifically evolutionarily sound and it's interesting how you know that those uh, sort of indigenous traditional uh concepts and uh ways of thinking are described as like wooey and stuff sometimes but they're actually very scientifically sound anyways that's a diversion um nowadays it's much harder to catch anything in the water because we have been extracting marine life from it in a way that you know the government will say is very well regulated and sustainably managed uh i don't think it is at all um and we've been doing that for centuries and you know we are sending more and more ships out every year they're going further from shore spending more time at sea and they're catching less fish every year so you know at some point you've got to get if if fishing is your livelihood and you live in alaska you've got to get on an industrial boat to go find the marine life you want to catch whether it's crabs or cod or whatever so um yeah it's consolidating do you know uh daniel polly yeah yeah, we had, I don't know him personally, but we had Daniel on the show a long time ago, right oh, when we cool. first started, and he was out of it. He was like, "There is no such thing as sustainable fishing. Like the yeah. best thing you can do is make some protected parks, essentially, for the fish to to live and regenerate. But this idea that you can in scale something to that degree, yes, and have it be a renewable resource is preposterous. Yeah, no, he's totally right. Um, you know. I mean, there are fishing traditions that have been sustained for thousands of years, but they're very strict about not fishing too much and protecting certain areas. Like in ancient Melanesia, if you went and trawled the seafloor, you would be put to death, or at least you would get a trial and maybe be put to death. <laughs> and even in like 16th century France, uh, there was a death penalty for trawling, you know, that was in rivers, I think. but still the way that it's changed and yeah this whole sustainable seafood thing and that's a big part of the way that fisheries are managed and we could get into that so essentially um there's this concept called maximum sustainable yield and this is part this is basically the core of modern fishery science as i would describe it and the idea is that you can reach a point at which you can extract the most fish possible per year without de decreasing the population by reaching a balance between having enough fish to produce uh, you know, the next generation, but also not having a population that's hitting up against other, um, other factors limiting their growth. And so 
the model, it's very simple and it's pseudoscientific the way it's so simple. And it's the, essentially the idea is if you reduce the population to half, that's when you see that maximum growth rate every year. And if you just take that entire growth every year, that's your maximum sustainable yield. And there are so many problems with that, that, you know, we could go into, first of all, the method of estimating how many there are, like we were talking about the crabs, like it's so fallible. Um, there's not hardly any error built in. And then you'll even have, uh, like in the United States, uh, you'll have people... Sorry, we're not la- just for people listening, I'm, I'm not laughing at you. Uh, your, your cat is, is actually uh, sort of petting your face with its tail. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. I'm she, sorry, that was totally an inappropriate thing to laugh at if you're listening. <laughs> Keep yeah, going, I'm crazy. sorry. She loves to walk on me when she hears me talking. Um, so, uh, maximum sustainable yield. And so a lot of, uh, you know, scientists from fishery science have come out very vocally uh, against this concept. Daniel Pauly, pretty strongly to a lesser extent, but other guys like Sidney Holt. um, Well, there was back in like the 70s. Oh man, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he wrote this uh, paper called An Epitaph to MSY. And, uh, you know, he talked about how we got to get rid of this concept. It's a drastic failure. And this was the year after the Magnuson-Stevens Act was passed, which basically codified this concept into uh u.s fisheries management and now it's globalized um but there was another guy sydney holt who said i'm paraphrasing here but it's the worst idea in fisheries science it institutionalizes and rewards greed and it really is a business concept it belongs in business school in my opinion it's not marine biology and just think about the way that we regulate other or just terrestrial wildlife right like imagine if you were saying like oh you know we're running out of pangolins so we need to figure out how to extract as many pangolins as possible every year without making them go extinct that would be preposterous if you went to CITES with that or something but it is the mainstream doctrine I mean, to some degree, you could, you could, and I, I'd like to play devil's advocate. And like, if you are, if you have a really large population and it's butting up against the carrying capacity of the landscape, and you're like, look, if we remove some of the herd, then you'll be able to have, you, you'll be able to prevent the herd from crashing because we know that that's what happens when you have a herd at carrying capacity and they continue to multiply. And then you have a huge population crash. There's a really interesting art, uh, story about some island. The moose. The moose. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is that those moose were introduced to that island. Yes, right? absolutely. So it was an artificial. The it was way an artificial that system. for for anybody who doesn't know the story, there was an island off of Alaska that was owned by the Russians that enslaved a bunch of Inuit to harvest seal pelts for them there, and in order to feed them, they brought in a herd of reindeer, and the reindeer uh, yeah, ate caribou. caribou. You're right, uh, and the caribou okay. ate, but not moose. Yeah. Um, they they had there's like reindeer moss that grew like crazy on the island because there had never been a caribou population there. And so ecologically, the idea of this carrying capacity and the population crash and the the way that species respond to their environment was deeply informed by this artificial system where they showed up to this virginal island that was filled with their food source. They multiplied like crazy. The herd, Exponentially. Yeah, the herd went up to like 50,000 or something crazy. It was a huge herd. And then within, within a decade, there was 10 of them left or something like that. Yeah, then completely crashed. And that happens in nature and in ecosystems. But when you're looking at a huge population like herring off the Pacific coast or something like that, that population has reached, the reason that they are relatively stable is because they've reached a dynamic equilibrium between their ability to reproduce and those carrying capacity, those limiting factors to their growth, right? So they're sort of hanging around that K value, that carrying capacity. So it's not like... You know, every population that we observe in nature is uh, growing exponentially like those reindeer and is about to crash. So, um, yeah, you can 
um, you can, you know, extract a certain number of fish without causing the population to go extinct, of course. And that's sort of the, that, that, that's obvious, right? Because people have been fishing for thousands of years, but the idea of MSY is let's figure out what the maximum value is and let's go for that. And the math and the modeling behind it is ridiculously simple and it's, uh, it's just ignorant of all these other factors at play and just the broader ecosystem, right? So basically the MSY doctrine is that we're going to cut all of the fish populations in the ocean, at least the commercially exploited ones and the crabs and the sea cucumbers and whatever other uh, industries that we have extracting marine life. We're going to cut them in half and then insist that that's an ecologically sustainable state that our marine ecosystems can persist in. And it's proven to not work very well. There's many, there are many cases where, um, I mean, like the crabs, the king crab, the arctic crab, uh, the tanner crabs are in poor shape, the cod up there, but uh, of uh, species managed under this MSY model that have totally collapsed, you know? And um, yeah, it's just it, like we have a lot of observational and experimental data to to show that um it can totally fail and we don't have really any to show that it can work in the long term because we've only done it for a century or two and and this in a sense gives the stamp of sustainability to these products yes yes so they use these uh models and one thing i want to know is that the united states so they use this ratio they're looking for the population relative to the population where MSY exists, right? So B over B MSY. And they're looking at this ratio 0.8. That's the UN definition, which means the population is 40% of what it used to be, of its carrying capacity or of its historic level. So that's our target for sustainability, a 60% reduction. But the United States even fudges that number to 0.25. So they're targeting 75% reduction of the population. And yeah, they want to basically insist that uh, the ecosystem can sustain itself if every commercially exploited species is at 25% of its historic level. And it's clearly not working very well. Oh, so the sustainability, right? So we get these uh, age, or there's, there's a number of different ways that this is done. Um, There's the most reputable one, which I still think is extremely fallible, is Seafood Watch, uh, run by Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. But there are all of these for-profit ones too, like the uh, MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, where basically it's a pay-to-play stamp. You pay them, you know, they assess your fishery, they look at the data, and uh, they're it's something like 80% of their revenue comes from licensing, licensing fees to get the MSC stamp. And you get that. It's a little blue check mark. You've probably seen it on tuna cans in the store or whatever. And yeah, there have been all sorts of, uh, like an investigation just came out last year. It's sort of ongoing. Another piece of it came out last week where basically it's maybe the world's biggest tuna fishing fleet, uh, the Chinese tuna fishing fleet in the uh, West Pacific is basically a front for a huge industrial shark finning operation. And they've been talking to all of these whistleblowers, uh, many of whom were enslaved on these ships. And, uh, you know, there's like horrible abuse. People die on the ships, but also they're saying, yes, we are intentionally fishing for sharks. We're intentionally cutting their fins off and uh, we're doing shark finning. And it's the, Government, Chinese government is not reporting it at all or hardly. And the MSC is putting their stamp on it and calling it sustainable seafood. And this is like 85% of the MSC tuna. Yeah. I mean, it, it sort of brings to mind a wider phenomena, which is the idea that you can, well, not you, but that, that some business entity can buy its way out of its abuses, which is very real. Yeah. And kind of has its roots and like when the church and the state were the same thing and you could buy your way into heaven with these indulgences and it makes me think of uh 
it makes me think of the way people slap the the green label on things as well uh and and they have this monolithic focus on okay well we reduced carbon dioxide from this situation you know don't mind all the thousands of other chemicals that we're dumping into the water tables or whatever because we're a green company yeah and With the offset markets now and everything yeah it's like its own market right all the green all the scrubbing technologies are their their own deal yeah some of it's that some of it's like these really sketchy uh, tree plantation projects that don't work very well. Some of them, I mean, I mean, and planting trees can be, don't get me wrong, like is important and, and can work and can help reforest places, but you know, g- generally natural regeneration works better, but also uh, carbon farming is a huge one now where this idea of uh, regenerative agriculture and building soil carbon has been monetized into these new markets that the USDA has these, calculators that farmers can sign up for and they can uh you know get money for essentially saying like oh i'm using these regenerative practices because i'm like putting more fences on my ranch and moving cows around or something like that and there's no real verification process measuring the carbon in the soil but we're pumping these subsidies or tax incentives more accurately into these industries and there it's almost like a bitcoin like uh speculation market you know where is they're trying to get in on these carbon credits uh early and then the value can go up and they start trading them it's and like bitcoin similar. people just are creating extraordinary quantities of externalities right people are set up these bitcoin farms and they're like using like yeah. the whole the electric grid from the small town they're in or something mm-hmm. it gets preposterous uh because yeah, you well, have there's this other one uh on, i was just talking to anastasia about this yesterday with the um or I, w- I was posting about it yesterday and you mentioned it uh with the methane di- methane digesters on factory dairies right so they are like you can get you can refine gas out of cow shit right biogas and um you know, that's a real thing and it works, but the externalities are wild, right? Like water pollution is horrendous and it doesn't account for, you know, the emissions from farming the cows in the first place, right? But we are putting, we've, uh, it, just in recent years, you know, in Biden's IRA climate bill and in the methane pl- pledges at COP and things like that, there are these huge, um, tax credits for these methane digesters and the amount of energy they're producing is marginal, right? It's like something like less than 2% of what solar is producing. And um, a lot of these factory dairies, they think are going to be making more money off of this cow shit than milk hmm. in the, like as these subsidies ramp up. And so I That's was reading this. That's a really, this, uh, really interesting curve because I'm like, the animal waste as an input into agriculture has always been super important. But as you shift towards more and more industrially produced fertilizer and less of the manure and less of the stuff that actually comes from the animals, that remains a useful resource. And so if you can well, find a way. It's not as important as you might think. It's something like 5 or 10% of animal waste that actually ends up being fertilizer. The rest of it is pretty much just runoff and pollution. Well, what, yeah, what I'm saying is that what it should be is that 100% of it is used for fertilizer and for agriculture. Yeah. Like, there should be no animal... Like, the fact that we're basically letting it run off into the water tables, into the rivers, into mm-hmm. everything else, is a catastrophe that has to be stopped, and it's one of the worst things... I mean, beyond the the, the violations of the animals themselves, the, the externalities of the, of the feedlots are horrible, but it's such a, it's, it's such a thing that's important for allowing agriculture to continue. And you talk yeah. about the, the, the running out of phosphorus, the difficulties mm-hmm. in, 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 in nitrogen processes, but you're just wasting this stuff. Yeah. But there's, a, there are problems with that too, right? They're trying to ramp up, um, using biosolids it's called biosolids as um which is sort of like animal sewage 
as fertilizer and it's incredibly contaminated. It's a huge source of PFAS pollution and other sorts of environmental contaminants. Wait, why? And uh, there's an example in... Uh, why, 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 does the, why does the cow poop have PFAS in it? Um, something to do with the fertilizers, something to do with the feed. Um, that's a good question. Well, they eat this stuff, exactly right? The why would they be eating PFAS? PFAS is like What's a Teflon. Everything, right? That's true, but I mean blood. like... Yeah, so it's it's sort of in everything, but it's concentrated in the biosolid waste. Interesting. Um, there are other ways to make fertilizer, right? You don't have to use manure. You can use vegetable waste. So like instead of taking the crop residues and putting them into these factory dairies, we could make fertilizer out of that. Well, let, let's, let, I mean, I, I want to talk, this is crazy though. Like where does fertil, where does industrial fertilizer come from? It's like, it comes as a byproduct of munitions development, which is like a whole other interesting like angle because, you know, again, commercial driving of world events. Obviously mm. we have the military industrial problem, which has kind of been marginalized in a sense like in the, i don't know i mean it's still mm. booming but it's not what it, it was promising around the time of the cold war or something like that but still uh those industries have to make money and i'm sure that you know well I, hold on one second to clarify the haber bosch process is the way that we make ammonia fertilizer and although it was a munitions related process during world war ii I, I, uh, what are you? How are you tying it back to m explosives? Now, are you saying that they're still making using the Haber-Bosch well, remember process? Remember in Beirut last year or two years ago, where that yeah. enormous fertilizer uh, repository just exploded? Yeah. And, I mean, it's extremely explosive. I don't know the origins of synthetic fertilizer, but it's something like half the fertilizer that we use in it's, the world. It's today. the Haber-Bosch process, more, actually. It, it literally like the, yeah. the, they won the Nobel Prize for the Haber-Bosch process, and so what they do mm -hmm. is they can catalyze. Hydrogen. I'm just wildly speculating. It's true. Okay. Was, okay. I'm just like. <laughs> I was like, hold I'm just on. Like, yeah, that just struck me as like interesting because you know, well, at the very least, there's an industrial uh, aspect to synthetic fertilizer that doesn't have to do with the products coming from the farms themselves, and so you're cutting out a pretty big middleman there. That's or, true, but this is like this is literally the definition of the green revolution. So like with the the minute that you start talking about messing with the inputs to agriculture, you get to this place where you 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 really have to wrestle with the world population because the world population is the size that it is because we have learned how to create massive amounts of fertilizer and put them into the agricultural system. Like they won the Nobel Prize for the Haber-Bosch process, not because they were bombing Jews during World War II, they, or sorry, World War I, never mind. Um, this is because they figured out a way to actually feed people beyond what could be supported by the inputs from either biomass or bio waste or biosolids or whatever you want to call it. Like we cannot feed the world population without the Haber-Bosch process. And so if you start to dismantle the industrial aspects of this, you're, I don't know what, what weights except for mass starvation. And the same thing with like the fisheries and stuff like that. Like if you, if you start to I mean, disband the yeah, agriculture. The yeah. Okay. The populations are not unilaterally skyrocketing still. No, they're not. But the rate at which you have to feed well, them. In another order to aspect them. that I'll throw out. Yeah. Is that. So oh, I think I got a little lag there. Um, all right. Uh, I, another thing I'll throw out is that we could feed everyone. We could feed 10 billion people with the amount of crops that we produce today. But there's an enormous amount of waste and inefficiency. inefficiency Mostly, I mean, there, food waste is a huge problem, but the, even more than that is simply the loss, the metabolic loss through animal agriculture. So when we take the crops and we feed them to animals, we get roughly 10% of that nutrient and cal caloric input back in the animal protein. So if we had a strictly plant-based agricultural system, we would need something like a quarter of the land that we do. And we could also potentially just, I mean, if we needed, I don't know if we'd need a quarter of the fertilizer, but we would need a lot less fertilizer. So it's. I think that it scales uh, linearly. Like if you're, if you're bringing could. it down. Yeah. Uh, 
de design a closed system. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that it's it's possible to design a closed system. Um, I think that it's it's not necessarily well established what that would look like. Like I think that this is this kind of comes back to what you were saying about this maximum sustainable yield being a pretty significant. It's a thing that they invented, which is a, a unit that is being used to establish what is effective and what will work. And as well, much safe. as it's safe and, and effective, it's safe and effective. But beyond being safe and effective, I think that it reaches into this idea of you know we don't understand how ecology works. We we can put complex numbers on it. We can and we can say that like look if we if we affect this input here and this is the output that we get. But that's that's not a real that's not a real science. It's 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 an assumption. And so for me, I'm like look what you want to do is you just want to impact the biosphere as little as possible. And you want to basically take a step back from the yeah. edge and instead of managing things and being like, we are capable of, of, of setting limits and knowing what to do and being able to propagate all these changes through a complex ecological network, just like do less. Like do less. There's this belief that we have this godlike ability yeah. to configure our surroundings, which is very human in a sense. But like we literally had a dude at NASA tell us that there would never be another glaciation. And we're just like, I literally didn't even know what to say. Like my jaw is just like on the table. Like r r you can, you're going to do that? Like, you know, that we have the ability to, to control the globe, like to our designs, you know, that it doesn't have its own plans for us as well. It's fascinating. Yeah. Or that we can, I mean, predict the spin-off effects is really the big thing. Like we can, you know, the maximum sustainable yield model is a theoretical model. And I think it sort of get, gets back to that issue with uh, Braxton Dew, you know, observing the crabs underwater and having a much using observational science to supplement theoretical and experimental science. Uh, to see if these theories actually work. And sometimes they don't. So it's really important to bring in that abs observational abs aspect and a bit of humility in terms of like what happens when we manipulate earth systems and how we might get unforeseen side effects. And like protect the objectivity of that observation as well, which mm -hmm. is the most tricky thing to do in science, even if you're working on something completely esoteric, like cosmology or something like how do you remove your own interests and in how this story plays out that's mm. that's the trickiest thing because science is fun i mean come on science is funded by industry mainly you can get some government funding and so forth but it's like y these big industrial granting organizations are at the home of a lot of the basic science and and this really pollutes our interpretation of how we see what we see Absolutely. under the microscope so I also also wanted to mention that uh, I'd never heard this term carbon tunnel vision before you, and I think it's freaking awesome. I think this is this is one of the coolest phrases that I've learned this this week, I guess, since I spoke to you. Yeah. So yeah, I guess we could sort of go back to um, I, I think maybe one of the important lessons from the crowd situation, and I think uh, something that is sort of on my mind a lot that I'm uh, in terms of my writing, but um, yeah. So this concept of carbon tunnel vision is the idea that essentially we have a tendency to uh, reduce or ignore other impacts besides climate change. So you'll hear people talk about environmental issues like X industry contributes X percent of global emissions. And that's, you know, an interesting and important stat, but that is not a proxy or a comprehensive evaluation of the environmental impact of this industry in any way, right? It's just one aspect. So there's this concept called um, the planetary boundaries, which it's you know very hard to calculate, but we're looking at concepts like air pollutants. I've got the chart up here, ecotoxicity, environmental uh, toxicity, um, biodiversity loss, eutrophication, uh, water. Um, oh, there's a more official one here. Where's that? Well, essentially, they set up these. Uh, here it is. Eight planetary boundaries, or maybe I'm. I gotta pull this up here. Here we go. Uh, biosphere integrity, climate change, novel entities. So we're talking about like um, 
uh, like plastic polymers and things like that, stratospheric ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosol loading, ocean acidification, biogeochemical flows, freshwater use, and land system change. So there's tons of, uh, tons of factors to keep in mind and to evaluate and sometimes weigh against each other in trade-offs when we're talking about how to feed ourselves, how to power our society in terms of energy and how to use water and things like that. And when we are only looking at the greenhouse gas emissions, we can often leave out a huge part of the story and ignore some really important things. So yeah, I think uh, the crab situation is a, a sort of a good example of how, you know, I, I had some reactions, you know, to my uh, just bringing forward the evidence of fishing mortality where people were sort of, and I don't want to say, you know, in bad faith or anything, but, you know, sort of like alarmed, like, oh no, are you like downplaying climate change? And I was, you know, and I'm like, no, like we have to look at how, you know, sometimes climate change can interact with marine life extraction and form an even bigger problem, you know? So we have to think about, there's another great example, I think with the water crisis that we're in, right? So um, it's particularly in the, in the West, where I live um, on in the Colorado River Basin, right? The Colorado River is at crisis lows. We're about to lose the uh, hydroelectric capacity of the Mead Dam, uh, the Hoover Dam, and the, uh, the Glen Canyon Dam. And um, a lot of the time we hear in media this crisis in terms of just climate change. And that's obviously a factor. But research shows that the Colorado River loses approximately 9% of its flow with every degree Celsius of global heating. Meanwhile, more than half of the river is consumed every year by one industry, and that's beef. 55% of consumptive water use on the Colorado River Basin is for irrigating alfalfa, hay, uh, and pasture. And if we just phased out those industries, like they've done in Saudi Arabia, for instance, and now they're taking our alfalfa to feed their cows. Um, well, yeah, because that, that's another crazy aspect of it, because it's not just domestic production. Like, it's not, an, it's, it's not just the fact that we're growing alfalfa to feed the cows that are sold by American companies or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's literally going to feed the cows in Saudi Arabia and China and wherever well, else. Well, that's an interesting one because they're mostly actually drawing that water from the aquifer instead of the river catchment. So, I mean, that's obviously a huge problem too. Like, it's not, uh, we're depleting that aquifer rapidly, but they're buying these credits dirt cheap from, I think the Arizona state government uh, from the aquifer and they're growing alfalfa because they can't grow, it's illegal to grow it in Saudi Arabia. That's and um, that's what they're feeding their cows with. But yeah, like if we just phased out that industry, we could in theory virtually double the flow of the Colorado River. And the impact on food production would be marginal. The amount of food produced by the beef industry is, is very small. It's something like 2% globally of the calories we eat. So um, yeah, it's interesting. Like when we think about carbon tunnel vision and we see this uh, river drying up and we're like, oh shit, climate change is drying up the river. And that's true, but we're not helping at all if we forget to think about how we're using that water God, like it's, I, I just think about how amazing it would be to live in a world where instead of the mantra being climate change or green or sustainable, it was like labels said like no regulatory conflicts of interest on the front of the tuna can or something <laughs> like that, you know, because that's much closer to the, the problem that we face in all of these different aspects of our, of our global ecosystem. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm really alarmed to hear you say that when you published the the p or when you when you started talking openly about maybe what was happening with the crabs in alaska that people were upset with you for for not 
putting climate change at the forefront because one of my biggest concerns is the cleavage of our society into two sides that won't find middle ground. And I think that one of the biggest cleavages is this idea of carbon being the most dangerous thing because it is a piece of of data that you, you see being used to measure the greenness of industries on, on one side. And on the other side, you have people being like, look, carbon isn't that bad and we can deal with carbon. And they point to historical carbon levels and they point to all of the stuff. And the weird thing is, is that they M probably aren't 100% wrong because carbon is one of those things that if the biosphere was capable of bouncing back, mm -hmm. it could metabolize and process it and it would be okay. And the thing that's really horrifying is all of the other stuff that's being destroyed. Like you, you casually said, you know, everybody's got PFAS, everybody's got microplastics, everybody's got these novel compounds. Mm -hmm. There's there's a huge amount of over over of over extraction that nobody likes on either side. And what I see is instead of people coming together over a shared desire for a biosphere that has a place for them and a biosphere that works together. And because not everybody's going to be vegan, not everybody, there, there are just people that you cannot push to that. But the thing is, is that you have to have a coalition with them anyways, because the only way that we will be able to throw off the yoke of, of the shit that we are in right now is by banding together. And if you have two groups that are cleaved by this thing of carbon is the most important thing, and you can come up with arguments on either side for why it is or why it isn't what you are doing is you are splitting the body of people that should be in revolt together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so there's a lot there. Sorry. Let me complicate. Yeah. Let me, let me go back to the, the first thing you said about how we can. Uh, so it's something like 30, 40% of carbon, historical carbon emissions that we can attribute to, uh, destroying the biosphere right so if we were in theory to restore the biosphere to like a pre-industrial state which is kind of an impossibility but you know it's a good goal um but obviously like where are we all going to go that's a good question um we could only really handle something like 30 40 percent of that uh historical carbon emissions the rest came from the geosphere so underground, so we have to, and this is another tricky thing that uh, is, is kind of hairy to talk about, that we, just cutting emissions doesn't solve climate change. We have to actually remove carbon from the atmosphere and ocean. And if we just cut emissions, eventually the concentrations of carbon would go down in the atmosphere, but that's because it's all dissolving into the ocean and it's acidifying the ocean during that process. So that's a complicated topic. Um, and then at least some of it has to also be, at least some so of it has to also be fixed by trees and by green plants, right? Yeah, like no, they, absolutely. And that's the best, most efficient way. I think yeah, yeah. it's, it's much faster than any uh, carbon removal technology that we have. Like, like, like what about a Zola? That, that's, a, 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 do you know, a Zola, the fern? No. Oh, this is oh, the such a yeah, cool this, story. This, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it, uh, maybe just share it with everybody because it's freaking crazy, like the history of it, especially the geological history. So they basically think that there was a glaciation period that was caused by an enormous float of a Zola fern that grew up in a pocket of fresh water at one of the poles. I don't remember if it was North Pole or South Pole. It was North but basically, there was glacial melt that had filled a basin, the basin filled with azola, and there was so much of it that it actually sucked enough carbon dioxide out of the air that when there was a significant turnover event where it all sank, the climate changed completely because it basically wasn't circulating the carbon anymore. It's really freaking easy to grow, too. Yeah, there was a guy who's working on a project. I'll, I'll, I'll do, after we get off, I, c I can find his contact info. Because he basically is like, this will save us in a way that nothing else will. Because he's like, we can grow this stuff, we can bury it, and you don't need industrial capture. It basically, mm -hmm. you can grow it on like scum ponds at cattle farms. It'll the eat roofs. the dirtiest water that is ever in, like imaginable and then you just bury it and you're done 
Yeah, and that's the key though, right? You have to bury it. It has to be go, return to the lithosphere. Mm. Or sink of, it. Yeah, well, it, that can potentially decompose at the bottom of the ocean, right? So it's, it's complicated. The storage aspect is, I think, even more complicated than the removal. But... Um, um, you were you were ta- we were we were talking about this idea of the need to get rid of the carbon and the fact that you're oh, not yeah. going to be able to get so it. Oh yeah. So the other thing I'll say is that uh, it's it, you know to an extent uh, reversing at least or restoring the chemistry of the planet is uh, feasible, but there are also these really important tipping points. Right? There are things that are extremely difficult to impossible to restore like we're talking like the permafrost or the Thwaites ice shelf things that would take millions of years to uh you know regenerate so it's it's very tricky uh you know it we can't uh exactly just reverse the carbon machine from blow to suck and get everything back to normal you know but in terms of like your broader uh, point about society and how we are fighting about, I mean, I don't know that it is the carbon thing. I, I, I think that is one issue, but I think people kind of argue about everything, you know? And I think that's kind of a symptom of our just like shared helplessness politically, you know, where we are just like so inundated and over involved in discourse in theory instead of like praxis you know but it's it's much it's hard to actualize um plans and really change the system but i think that's the important thing and you're right like we have to work together with people from all sorts of different backgrounds and and form like broad coalitions and that's you know how we see political change work throughout history but um yeah, I think part of the reason that we, there's so much like infighting, so to speak, is kind of just the way that those things are so hard. I mean, to to some degree, I I, I also think that there is a tremendous feeling of of people pointing at each other and being like, you are bad, you yeah. have bad beliefs, and your beliefs mm-hmm. make you bad. And I'm like, you guys there are there are bigger things that we have to concern ourselves with which is the fact that we are being devoured by a machine that nobody appears to be in charge of and we will go down with the ship as long as we continue to be like well those are th- those that group is problematic and so we can't have them because they deny climate change i'm like yeah just to clarify what you mean is that again corporate superstructures are driven by growth exclusively there's yes. there's no human right at mm-hmm. the helm because the humans that are pushing the buttons will easily be swapped out if they don't meet the growth yeah, absolutely. standard. It's, it's a program. Like there's, there's basically a program that's running and that program is, you know, like y- this is the AI takeover yeah, that this people is are the terrified AI. about. This is, really this is. like board of directors. It's yeah. not like some like matrixy robot thing. It's like, it's yeah, just absolutely. happening. It's happening right now in the programs of our civilization. And my larger point, which is, this is like the drum that I always beat, which is that, look, the idea that you will stop climate change, period. Maybe you can stop anthropogenic contribution to the destabilization of the biosphere. That is a statement that you cannot necessarily put on a slogan, but I'm 100% behind that. But the idea that you can stop climate change, period, on a geological level is foolish to a degree that strikes fear into my heart because instead of focusing on resiliency and really being able to create societies that can sense changes and then have their industrial methods reflexively shift with those changes. Because I'm like, look, we had this guy on the podcast a while ago who had a mechanism for the last ice age. And his mechanism was the fact that the crust had shifted. Like the entire crust of the earth just went whoop. And shifted. And he has excellent data for it. He works at the Utah, Utah State Geology Survey. Like, not a kook. Like, fantastic analysis. He has spent the last, like, decade or more of his life working on this. It is very, very convincing. That's the level of stuff that this planet can do to us. 
the like planet killing asteroids, the crust shift, the jet stream breaking down. There are things that we cannot even begin to fathom that will destroy us. And the idea that we can control the planet as an entity altogether is so I just I think it's I, I think it's foolish. Right, but at the same time, like you can see the impact of burning fossil fuel and just releasing greenhouse gases in general like we are geoengineering the planet Absolutely. in that aspect so we have to think about how to reverse that and the climate's always changing but throughout most of our evolution it's been in this cycle of dynamic equi equilibrium with the glacial and interglacial periods right and i haven't heard about that theory so was he saying that that cycle was getting kind of upturned right before we He's basically started oh, go ahead. changing everything. Uh, I mean, there's this. I mean, here's basically all you need to know. The last glacier was not centered over the North Pole. That, that's really like that's what it comes down to. It was centered over Greenland, which is very bizarre, actually. And and there's um there's very little attention paid to this detail. I mean, it's it's clearly like Siberia was temperate during the last glacial period. Like that's kind of all you need to know. Like, so okay. there's, there's probably something else going on there. Um, whether or not the, the crust was in a different location or something, but, uh, there's this idea that human beings have this godlike ability and not just human beings, but our own regulatory, uh, our governance really. I mean, this goes back to like, the God King idea of a leader, what you want is to embody, you want your leader to embody this all powerful. It's a very comforting concept that your, your leadership, your governance can take care of everything. And we've blown, we've taken that to the next level where it's like, well, we can just control the whole universe. I mean, the whole. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's really the thing that I'm trying to say, which is I'm like, look, we have to restructure our society. We have to have a future where the material basis of society is not burning shit. Because I look around and I'm like, this feels Neolithic, that in order to get energy, you're burning stuff. You're cutting down trees and you're burning them. It feels like it is, it, it, it's so stupid. There's no other way to put it. Mm. Even if you had endless things to burn, it would still be stupid. Like even if you could constantly yeah, regenerate it. Polluting the air. Exactly. And like we live we live in the country. And every single goddamn person here has a wood stove. And yeah. they don't have green waste collection. And so people collect all of their green waste all year long and then come the first rains, right after everything is soaked, they pour kerosene on their huge pile of green waste and they burn it. And this is wow. first person perspective. It's like, oh, thank God the forest fires are over. Like we had our first rain. Ah, we can breathe again. And it's like, nope. And it's just like, yeah. we're in this like little valley and it's so bucolic and it's very pretty, but it's, you could cut the air with a knife. Like the cat goes outside and she comes back smelling like burnt hot dog. <laughs> wow. And you know, that's classified as renewable energy, right? Yeah. 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 That, yeah what is yeah. it? What is it called? Biochar? Uh, well, that's a little bit different. Uh, what do they call it? It is a green technology, though, which is pretty hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. It's yeah, but I mean, they're uh, like they're using uh, they're again like giving tax incentives to like for for instance in uh, the Pacific Northwest in uh, places like Ferry Creek where we have this huge uh, resistance movement come together, with hundreds of people allying with the Pachi Dot Nation to you know try to stop uh, this one little patch of forest from getting logged. And, you know, people have been sort of uh, trying to figure out for a while like what all this timber timber is going to. And yeah, a ton of it is just wood pellets for wood stoves. And so yeah, like it's crazy. Like these are things that need to be absolutely reset and redone and reimagined. And you know, in the Pacific Northwest, I always wonder why we don't have more geothermal heat because it's like we're we're on huge volcanic areas. And I understand that there's difficulty for the infrastructure. I understand the basalt is difficult to dig through. But I'm like, I am sure that we could stop burning things at least for. Well, we have heat. nuclear, right? I mean, we do have That's nuclear like whole... power, and it's by far and away the safest 
mechanism of generating power that we know of in terms of the deaths and disease that have resulted from it. And so there is this need to push things forward. And I really, really worry that what we are doing is we are focusing more on the continuation of the industrial cycle that we are so used to because that's the way that we know how to fix things. Instead of just taking, I, I just like, I the way that I see it is I just imagine us as a species, as a huge pair of hands just squeezing the planet. And I'm like, just let it go. Just like, let it go. Stop squeezing and it will it will recover. Because out here in the Pacific Northwest, I, I, the when Mount St. Helens erupted, Everyone was basically like, this is going to be a catastrophic wasteland for the next few centuries. Nothing will grow here. This is like a nuclear explosion. And you come back now and it is so vibrantly beautiful. And like, yeah, right around the volcano, there's still a lot of pumice and there's still a lot of destruction, but it's recovering. It's home to the largest herd of elk in, in the continental United States. There's a lot of wildlife. There's a lot of green that's coming Mountain back. Goats. Mountain goats. I mean, there's definitely some of it that's been replanted because Weyerhaeuser has huge plantations around it. But there's a limit where they basically kept it as a scientific area of study and Weyerhaeuser didn't plant anything there. And even and you can see, actually, because you get mm. to the edge of the plantation and the trees, they're clones and so they're geometrically perfect. They're like puzzle pieces and you can see on the hillside the way that they like tessellate into each other. And it it's you can see that they're identical and then you cross over and all of a sudden it's Crazy. this landscape that's that's breathing again. I think what you're like getting at is that coming up with more industrial technological solutions to an industrial technological problem is a really funny snake eating its tail situation when you step back from it. That's exactly right. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. But of course we need, and it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. Like this mantra tech won't save us. I, I hear a lot. But like almost no one that says that thinks that we don't need renewable energy tech or like uh, high speed trains and things like that. It's all tech. So like the way that we think of some things as technology and some things as, or, you know, we don't think of them as big tech or whatever is I think a little bit arbitrary. And there are, there are you know, issues with um, the way that we're manufacturing uh, solar panels, for instance, right now. and um, you know, I, I think they could be solved, but it's it's tricky when you start saying like this technology good, this technology bad. We need to think about context and like think about how to use them together. And I mean, I would say that there are some technologies that are kind of unequivocally bad, like those methane digesters. Like that shit is just ridiculous. <laughs> but um, no, yeah. I think it's a matter it's, of looking beyond it, right? It's 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 like. Obvious, yeah. I don't. I love technology, right? I mean, look around this room right now. The fact that we're hanging out, you know, a thousand miles away from one another is kind of incredible. So, obvious. I'm not at all like a luddite about technology. I just think that the the root of this problem is more. Um, it's yeah. it's really more of a spiritual paradigm, or I I mean that word's kind of weird, but uh, like a interpersonal. It's a social level I issue with how we have organized our society around something that isn't human. It's just mm. like, what are what's going on here? And how do we get back from that? And what are the ways in which we evaluate good technology versus bad technology in a way that aligns with that? Because I think you're exactly right, that technology bad is also a bad way of going about it. For sure. And I just, the, the stuff about the carbon capture, it just worries me because it continues the line of carbon tunnel vision and it allows industries to build plants that they're like, hey, we're, we're mitigating everything that we're doing, but what they're not really mitigating is all of the other stuff that they're putting into the landscape. And that's the stuff that will remain for a long, long, long time. Yeah, so like we can th look at, um, so there's a lot of different, it, it's tricky because I think a lot of people, they hear carbon removal and they think of carbon capture and sequestration at a smokestack, right? Which is not a carbon negative process. It's just like a mitigation technique and a huge greenwashing boon for uh, fossil fuel, right? And they're milking the shit out of that. But um, like we do have to remove carbon and yeah, I think definitely the best way is uh, it's even more than uh, 
forests, it's like coastal ecosystems like mangroves and seagrass beds can sequester carbon at insane rates. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously that conflicts with kind of fishing interests and things like that. So that becomes tricky as well. But um, there are other things too that we can do that are, are pretty low tech actually, like uh, direct air capture. Like we can basically put these um, adsorbents in, like we have all these cooling towers. I was reading about this uh, new theory or this new application. And we already have these cooling towers for uh, all sorts of industrial things. And if we just put carbon adsorbents in those towers, we could make a significant contribution. I don't want to say what number, but it, it would make a significant dent in um, you know, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. And then, of course, we'd have to figure out how to store those, how to bury those reliably for thousands of years or whatever. But like some of these like technologies are pretty like low impact, low risk. And, you know, I think they're totally worth pursuing and things like uh, solar radiation management too. Like there's people think of uh, people's minds go to stratospheric aerosols, right. Which I think is very scary. Like the, we don't know what will happen with that. It sounds very dangerous, but there's other techniques for solar radiation management by just like making roofs reflective and stuff that are just like obvious things that we should be doing, you know? So it's tricky because technologies get like a stigma and then we kind of categorize things in a certain way. And then like, yeah, you're a tech bro or an eco modernist and you're like a Luddite and this kind of thing. And all that's not helpful. Like, I think we're doing too much philosophy. Mm. I mm. hate philosophy, even though we're talking about it like really deep right now, but it's like, it's so it's reductionist, you know, like well, we're well, trying to categorize things into philosophies that just don't really make sense. Well, we're trying to, we want to come up with solutions really is, is the goal, what everybody should be concerned with. And, and sometimes exploring the landscape philosophically is hopefully fertilizer for solutions, but mm. You know, what we really want is to make, come up with a sentence of, hey, folks, this is what we can do. Let's all get on it that everybody can get behind who's red or blue or whatever. Um, and, and that's unfortunately not readily available right now to us. I, I wish I could put that in a sentence for you. But, but I think a unifying force is that people want to live on a planet that is well taken care of. I think that they want to be well taken care of. I think that they want to know that their children will survive and flourish. And again, naive platitudes, but it is so, it, it's so simple, the things that we want and the, the ways in which we don't engage in action of changing regulations for letting people paint their roofs crazy colors or letting them put you know, green roofs on, on their on their houses so you can actually cool evaporatively during the summer. Mm. The technology exists. The thing that is keeping it from happening is that we don't have our hands on the levers of power. And if you yeah. look at the lobbying in Congress, it's quite obvious why we don't have our hands on the lever of power. And my mind is that the last place where we can really accomplish that is through the judicial system which is that if you don't have the ability to get things done at the executive branch or the legislative branch, the only hope that you have for yourself in this country is being able to establish court precedent. And go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that's that's been huge for um, you know all sorts of environmental movements, whether it's protecting wildlife using the Endangered Species Act or... Uh, protecting tribal sovereignty for uh, that. I mean, they shut down tons of uh, fossil fuel infrastructure projects uh, using the legal system. But um, yeah, I'll let you finish your thought. But yeah, litigation is a huge and important way to... Uh, it's not affect. permanent, though. It's not litigation... Uh it's not permanent is the problem. Like, I really think that the change has to be legislative because that's the only way to make sure yeah. that it never rears its head again or that somebody doesn't have... The thing is, fighting a legal battle is inundating, difficult, technical, and requires a ton of money, basically. Oh, yeah. Um, 
And so, like, yeah, you could be really brilliant and, and fight your way through it, perhaps on a small budget. But these companies have whole teams of lawyers dedicated to these endeavors. And it's like, I, I just fear that they would be able to argue their way out of damn near anything. And that, it depends that, on the judge you get to in a huge way. Oh, for sure. Yeah, right. Because we, we have this image of the judicial system as being objective. And it's like, uh, it's not true. No way. <laughs> Justice is not blind. Justice is human, just like the rest of us. But legislatively, if we could really come up with some uh, values oriented, some statement that appealed to literally everyone, um, I do think that we would have the ability to change the constitution in a fundamental way. And I think that Shiloh's right about this, which is that the goal is to amend the constitution in such a way that regulatory capture of the government can be avoided. And this is despite the fact that you, the government starts out in a corporate form and has become progressively more so. And regu- like rewriting, or what do you say, amending the constitution is almost impossible but it it isn't impossible and that it it is ultimately uh, a decision that comes down to the people's voice because if the people really do stand up and say that congress needs to do this or else it can be done in a way that doesn't depend on the judicial uh you know subtleties foibles, foibles and yeah and i think that this is the unifying factor right money i guess everyone that I have ever talked to, no matter their political philosophy, agrees that corporations are screwing us and they're screwing this country. And it doesn't matter what your background is. Everybody's just like, yeah, sucks. It sucks, but my retirement fund depends on yeah. investing in them or something. You know? yeah. Well, yeah, that's an interesting point. So like, I think this sort of is a good, like a good sort of uh segue to talk about theories of change i guess and basically i think you know it's easy to picture rapid change which is what we need of course and uh, coming from the top down but it's it's rare that that's exactly how it works in history but essentially i think it's a matter of figuring out every lever and every approach we can take and doing all of them Mm. right so we need to have litigated litigation campaigns we need to have legislative campaigns we need to have electoral campaigns we need to have direct action campaigns mutual aid campaigns and we need to have economic campaigns like boycotts and divestments and things like that so sometimes people can say like oh this one like i don't want to vote because it's annoying and frustrating and we never win and that's true but you should still do it i don't want to boycott this industry because i'm just one person and my little contribution doesn't matter but when we add it up it actually does make a difference or like i want to divest my uh pension fund from an oil corporation like half of the oil stocks are in retirement funds people don't even know that they're investing in these things like the big stock brokers and stuff like they're not even investing in oil as much as us regular people just being tricked to signing up for a 401k or whatever. So yeah, we've got to pull all those levers and we just got to do all of them and stop complaining about, (laughs) about, you know, like, I mean, we, it's, it's good to like complain about the problem and commiserate and and strategize, but like, just, you know, like what, when I don't know, there's just like too much criticism of different approaches. People are going to take different approaches and like, I'm not, a lawyer, you know, but I'm going to support people that I think are using the legal system strategically to, you know, affect change. And I think we got to look at everything the same way. I think you're absolutely right. And the way that I see it is like, if you can lay out a roadmap for all of the different ways in, because you, I, I think about this in terms of problem solving all the time, you have to have a single goal, which is why when you talk about climate change, the goal has been carbon. Like when we were talking to Polly, we talked to him about the same thing. And he's like, look, the reason that we point to carbon is because we fundamentally believe that if we can get the carbon lever, if we can pull on the carbon lever and we can organize people behind it in order to affect change, then we will be able to pull on all the other levels, levers. Mm. Like he recognizes that the carbon lever is not the lever, but he's like, it is a strategy. We have, we have dedicated ourselves to it. It is what needs to happen 
because this is the movement and we will go on after that. And I'm like, okay. So what we, it does, it does. And so what I'm saying we need is we need to have a vision for what the end result is, right? What is the thing that we are all working together and the divestment and the boycotts and the legislation and the elections and the judicial system, like what is the goal? Because if you don't have a unified goal that everyone can really believe in and then separately work on in their own ways, you won't be able to have a unified sense of we are working on this together in all of our own different ways. And for me, that goal is to release the hold that corporations and capitalist profits have on our lives. Yeah, that's a pretty good overarching theory. I don't know how many... Like a lot of people don't, uh, you know, getting everyone on board is a different question, right? A lot of people are really invested in the idea of capitalism, the the idea that they could, uh, you know, rise up through the ranks or whatever and become their, become a billionaire and all that stuff. So it's, it's really problematic. Like there's the way that, uh, I mean, we're brainwashed, you know? And so a huge part of it is like re, rethinking everything. And it's really hard to make some people kind of question the system, especially when they've benefited from it. And if you don't have any bumpers on the lanes either, like if I don't personally have a problem with people, I, I think it's, I think that it's played out a lot better than some of the alternative systems of the government in some ways. I mean, in terms of people having mobility in their society, and that's great. But the ways in which they achieve that mobility need to be you know, funneled and they need to be, uh, they need to be bordered. And, and that's something that as human beings, we can all get behind. It ties back to what you were saying earlier, which is that there are limits that traditional societies have always placed on extraction. And it is not the fact that you can't extract. It is not the fact that you can't become wealthy. It's not the fact that you can try to be a billionaire. It's the fact that if you are a billionaire, you cannot build your fortune on the backs of Congolese children that mine cobalt for your products Mm. or the, the, the destruction of the fisheries for generations to come. Like, build your fortune. Maybe we won't see the fortunes that are the same size because there's no way to build that kind of fortune with those controls in place. But yeah. you know what? They're going to start space mining soon, so Lord knows. <laughs> that's a whole other... Yeah, I mean, that's, an- <laughs> that's another interesting thing. Like, I almost... I'm... Like, asteroid mining sounds better than mining the Congo, doesn't it? Like, if we could capture an asteroid and we can get all our copper from the surface of that asteroid, which, by the way, would be much easier than a Mars colony or something like that. It, it's actually... But the thing is, it's, it's not profitable. That's why we're not doing it. Yes. We have to set up all the industry out there, too. It's funny... You have because- to capture the asteroid in orbit, and then you have to, like, send all the machinery out there. But it's feasible, and it's an interesting... It, it, I think it's kind of interesting how it could be conceived, like as a way to alleviate uh, mining operations yeah. in the global south. I think know? it's a freaking great idea, but it's funny, like, I, you know, I teach at the local university, uh, I'm teaching an intro astronomy class right now, and we were talking about projects for developing the moon and moving industry to lunar orbit and stuff, and, like, there's the, like, the kids, like, freak out. Like, they're like, no, like, we can't, we can't even take care of our own planet, how can we destroy these other planets? And, and, it's a really, in- I was sh- I was kind of surprised. I was like, whoa, like I just saw people's face. I had to stop and like actually like unpack this because people were just up in arms about that idea. But at the same time, it's like, well, we can, you know, space is essentially unending as far as we can tell. There's, there's a uh, perfect vacuum, which is great for industrial manufacturing. We can actually give the planet a chance to do its thing back here. And, uh, I don't know. I, I'm pretty stoked on it, but I, it's a very hard sell to people for whatever reason. Yeah, I mean, if if the if the you know choice is getting co- copper from an asteroid or like Oak Flat or something, right. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna you know go for the asteroid. And I don't think it's a crazy idea. I don't know. Like, I'm not into the idea of like colonizing or terraforming other celestial bodies. I think we're like 
I think it's kind of hubristic that it'll work. I, I'm just very skeptical about uh, it working or even being fun or cool. Like, like <laughs> it's going to be a painful it. project. Yeah, uh, you know, it just sounds sucky. Yeah, I think Elon wants and, to has a goal of moving like a million so, people but, there. Yeah, so. in terms of like just trying to get resources. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> He's never they're, uh, they're not going to be the uh, middle class uh, either <laughs> yeah. to come through on one of his uh, ideas <laughs> i like i'm i'm yeah. i really um i think that there's a tendency to believe that the the limits that we have upon ourselves and the things that we do are foundationally stupid and that they can be done away with but the reality of the situation is that we find ourselves in the bind that we are in because we have everyone who came before us made the choice that has led us here. And so if we need copper, you're not going to get rid of the need for mm. copper barring some fantastical invention. And so I guess you can be a material scientist and try to find some way to replace copper that you can invent out of thin air. But there are physical limitations to things. And so I think it's really hard to accept that at some point because when I was younger, I was so diehard against everything that was produced by the capitalist system and everything that was material. I was like, this is the dumbest thing that we are doing. And as I've grown older, I've kind of come to realize where I'm like, well, there are systems and the systems have to function and they need inputs. And those inputs have to come from somewhere. Otherwise, we're all living in smoke-filled hovels, like tending cow shit. Like, it's not just copper. Co copper it's like copper... It's also all these trace elements that you have to mine. Mm -hmm. You have to dig huge holes to get just a little bit out of them. Yeah. But some of yeah. the uh, like inert bodies just floating around in space have tons of this Molybdenum. stuff. Molybdenum. Yeah, all this Cobalt, nasty yeah. stuff, which you don't need that much of. But um, it, you know, it would make a lot of sense to grab those as opposed to yeah, what's Suppose happened to eat. Africa. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, we've been uh, we've been talking for almost two hours now, so I think that we should let you go, Spencer. <laughs> yeah, it's been a it's been a real privilege to spend this time with you, though. I, I I've really enjoyed making your yeah opinions. yeah. We could wrap it up. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. Do you have any closing uh, thoughts? Yeah. I love your work yeah. too. Uh, everybody you don't uh, have tarp carbon tunnel vision. <laughs> think about uh, yeah. Think about uh, everything that we do and the impacts of it, and you know, yeah. Don't. I don't know. Just, I think we had a good conversation, very complicated. And I think that's kind of what it comes down to, you know, like if you talk to other people, we can reach consensus and sometimes we can't, but like we can find some, uh, and that's the way to chart a path forward. And so, and support diverse methods of doing so, right. As long as we have this value alignment as a culture where we're actually able to focus on what is fundamentally broken, then we can move towards it in different ways and support people who are maybe doing it in a different way than us. Um, but we're all, see how we're all oriented in the same direction. Um, because I think people really, really do want the best generally, despite how crazy their ideas turn out to be at the end of the day. So, yeah, thanks for coming by, man. Where can people find, uh, you know, uh, obviously you, you write for some different publications and uh, you're on Twitter? Yeah, yeah. I guess Twitter is the best place to see all my stuff. Uh, unpop science, unpop underscore science, you know, as opposed to pop science. Um, yeah, just check me out there. Uh, I'll, I'll be posting my articles. Um, I'll have a new one coming out in Nautilus soon about the crab situation. I've talked to the whistleblower. I've talked to Noah. I've talked to fishermen. I've talked to uh, observers. Um, so, yeah, it should be really interesting. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Spencer. Check it out. Thanks for having me.